glance or at first hearing, it seems like kind of an odd and disjointed passage to preach on. Actually, it's, it's three little passages. So Jesus and his disciples are on the move, and they are sailing across the Sea of Galilee. And the disciples realize that they forgot to bring any bread to eat. Jesus warns them about the the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. And the disciples continue to, to fret over not bringing enough bread. So Jesus calls their faith into question. He says, you know, seriously, guys, don't worry about the food. They arrive in Bethsaida. Jesus heals a blind man, but it takes him two tries. Then Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter makes this well-known, wonderful profession of faith. Now, out of all the stuff that happened that I just read about, the thing that was most compelling to me is that miracle account where it takes Jesus two tries to accomplish what he was trying to accomplish. That's strange. That's out of the ordinary. That's weird. Now, Granted, the miracles of Jesus are all supernatural and and they're out of the ordinary. But what I mean by out of the ordinary with regard to this one is that, you know, how many times in the Gospels does it take Jesus two tries to get something right? That's what was kind of compelling to me uh, this week. Just like last week, Um, we had that kind of weird statement that when Jesus goes back to his hometown, he wasn't, uh, he, well, he couldn't do any miracles there except for heal a few people. And so we're going to land on and we're going to try and understand this miracle account. But there's a a reason why I included the the little passage before and the little passage after. And so in these three short and seemingly very separated events, what is it that holds them together? Well, I would argue that it has something to do with faith. What it is and how it works. So let's get into it. Verses 14 and 15. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warns them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Now, what in the world is that all about? That seems like a kind of a strange response to the disciples worrying about having enough bread. We have to understand that the the little passage before the ones that we get into is about Jesus feeding the 4,000. And after Jesus feeds these 4,000 people with a mere uh, seven loaves of bread, the Pharisees come to him and they uh, demand a sign from him as though what he had just done wasn't quite good enough. And so they come to him and they have the the gall to demand a sign. So the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod, what Jesus is talking about here is uh, the hardness of heart and the willful denial of faith that the Pharisees and Herod exhibited and expressed. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, watch out for that kind of lack in your faith. Well, verse 16, they discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. So they didn't seem to get what Jesus was talking about. He 
uh, Jesus must have seemed kind of agitated and, and angry and frustrated. And the disciples are, are kind of speculating as to the reason. And the only thing that he, they can come up with is that, well, Jesus is a little bit ticked off because we forgot to bring the bread. But the reason, the actual reason why Jesus is a little bit short with the disciples and why he says what he says becomes abundantly clear in the, the next thing as Jesus continues. He, in essence, confronts the disciples about their own lack of faith. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And, and don't you remember what just happened? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up? And they said, well, we picked up 12. And when I broke seven loaves for 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up in the aftermath there? And they said, well, it was seven. And Jesus said to them, do you still not understand the disciples are worried about bread but jesus had just fed four thousand people with seven loaves of bread and before that he had fed five thousand people with just five loaves of bread and two fish and so jesus in essence is saying to them confronting their faith how much do you guys need to see me do or accomplish before you actually believe how much do i have to do how much do you have to bear witness to before you actually have a little bit of faith to work with you need to understand fellas that i've got this you don't have to worry about the amount of bread we have with us don't worry about silly things like like having what you need today because i've got it you're with me have faith so that's the first section and now we're going to jump ahead a few verses to the last section that we read so Jesus and his disciples are traveling around to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do other people say that I am? And they have uh, a few answers for him. They say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. And still others say that you're one of the prophets. And now, now here's the big question. Here's the important question, okay? Jesus says, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter stands up and he's celebrated for this. He says, you are the Christ. In other words, you are the Messiah. You are the chosen one of God. Christ has a, a pretty loaded meaning. And then Jesus warns them not to tell anyone about him. And so I think that you could argue that here, in Peter's response, Jesus gets exactly what he was looking for from his disciples. A bold profession of faith. So, we have this strange miracle account bookended bookended by two accounts, two stories that are obviously about faith. So now we're ready to take a look at this strange story of Jesus healing the blind man. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Now, as I said before, the blind man here was healed in a way that is uh, totally unique in the Gospels. Jesus did restore this man's sight, but it took two tries, or it happened in two stages. Now, there's no way of knowing for sure 
why Jesus decided to act in this way on this occasion. But as I said before, it seems to have had something to do with this man's faith. It seems to have had something to do with the fact that this man didn't have much faith, and so he didn't initially get much healed. But then, as he gained more faith, he gained more healing. I know I'm on dangerous ground here, but just stick with me, okay? Let's consider the details of the story as Mark records it. So like the paralytic who was lowered into the house earlier in Mark by his four friends, this blind man had not come to Jesus on his own. And the motivation to come to Jesus does not seem to have been his either. Rather, it was the man's friends who brought him. But Jesus, you know, isn't really all that interested in your friend's faith and he's not all that interested in your parents faith and and he's not really all that interested in your church's statement of faith either jesus is interested in your faith and jesus is interested in my faith and he was interested in the blind man's faith not the faith of his friends. So verse 23, the first part of it, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus took the blind man by the hand and took him somewhere else. Now why is it that, why is it that Jesus chose to lead him it seems it seems more natural that jesus would say to this man's friends hey we're going to go to a different place why don't you guys lead him and i'll tell you where we're going to meet up outside of the city but you know i as i read the story i believe that jesus wanted a little bit of time a little bit of travel time very close together with this man so that he could get acquainted with him. See, the thing is, when you serve a person, even in a small way like that, you, you quickly become friends. You, you build some trust. You, you get to know someone in his or her area of need, and you uh, do an act of caring for them. And those feelings are mutual. And so Jesus seems to have very purposely spent some quality time by the, or with this blind man before we even get any talk about a miracle. Jesus got to know this person, and I'm sure got to know whether or not this person had any faith. And also, this little walk together gave the blind man an opportunity to develop some faith. Verse 23b, when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? So when they arrived at the place where Jesus wanted to be, outside of the city, away from the crowds, place where they weren't going to be distracted, Jesus put saliva on the man's eyes now that sounds terribly disgusting doesn't it sounds terribly disgusting but you know the use of saliva for therapeutic reasons back then wasn't really all that uncommon even today if you if you cut your finger and it's bleeding you might put it in your mouth in order to soothe it and to to stop the bleeding right But usually when you cut your finger, granted, you don't put it in someone else's mouth. Uh, I've tried. They don't appreciate it at all, okay? But anyway, but, you know, getting back to the story, 
You know, even if it wasn't uncommon to uh, use saliva for certain therapeutic purposes, why would anyone do such a thing for blindness which had no known cure? I guess what I'm saying is that those that were standing by and bearing witness to this probably weren't grossed out by what Jesus was doing, but they probably did think it was strange. But Jesus asked, do you see anything? The statement that follows tells us that that question was actually necessary. Verse 4, the man looked up and said, well, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. So the man looked up. He hadn't really even been trying to see before. Uh, he had his head bowed and, and his eyelids closed, I would assume, probably tightly closed on account of the little solution that Jesus had put in them. But now he does look up and he does see at least a little. He said, I see people. They look like trees moving around. But you know, and can you understand that this that this partial vision would have made the little measure of faith that this man had soar to brand new heights. Do you see how that could be the situation here? And so Jesus does his thing with the man's eyes. This man who had not much faith, not much hope, not much confidence that anything could be done, and he opens his eyes and he sees something. He sees something, not perfectly clearly, but he sees something. Do you think that if you were in the same situation, your faith would soar to new heights? I think, I think that mine would. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. So Jesus, after his initial touch of the man, and then his initial touch in healing of the man's eyes, gives the man a second touch, and immediately the man's eyes are fully opened, his sight is completely restored, and he saw everything clearly. What, what a lovely, lovely story. But I said, because of the story that precedes it, because of the story that follows it, that I believe that this miracle has something to do with faith. But I also said, I'm kind of swimming without a lifeguard here, because not a lot of the commentaries did much with this passage, surprisingly. We can't be absolutely sure that Jesus needed to touch him twice because of the man's tiny faith. After all, Jesus can do whatever he wants. Jesus has the power. And he could have healed the man with, with one touch, or he could have healed the man with no touches, or he could have healed the man without speaking a word. But I think that Jesus was demonstrating to this man, and he was uh, demonstrating to everyone who was present that day, and he was demonstrating to us the importance of faith. Faith, which is a gift from God, but then when it comes to the nurturing and growth of that faith, we have a part to play. The importance of faith. Again, we can't know for sure. We can't know Jesus' intentions because he doesn't explicitly tell us. But you know, brothers and sisters, this we can be sure of. Jesus didn't stop until the man was fully healed. Jesus didn't stop until the man was fully healed. Jesus doesn't do any halfway healings. He works until the job is done and the outcome is perfect. I mean, I think that's the most beautiful truth of this story. And it's true with respect to, to my life and your lives as well. Now, we may not be blind, but in all sorts of ways, our lives need some fixing, too. Our bodies need some fixing, and, and our attitudes definitely need some fixing. And, 
And our relationships certainly need some fixing. And and our habits aren't really what they probably could and should be. We are sinful. Like poorly maintained machines, we are worn and we are overheated and we're not firing on all cylinders. We're prone to self-destruction and we are even a hazard to others oftentimes as well. As fallen human beings, we can't keep our lives running well. But Jesus is a master mechanic. He's fixing us all the time. He's tinkering with us every day. And someday we are going to be in heaven. And we will be perfect, never to need fixing again. See, that's another beautiful truth. But in the meantime, with regard to faith, we all need to stay close to Jesus. We need to be mindful of putting ourselves in the position where Jesus can continue to work on us and continue to tinker with us so that his continuing touches will continue to bless our lives. And that, I think, is what Jesus was looking for in this story. That's what I think Jesus is looking for in our own lives. Faith. And also, of course, the courage to make a profession of faith like Peter does at the end of our section. Now, brothers and sisters, many of you and I have made profession of faith. And we try to live by that faith, but, you know, it... It ultimately won't mean all that much unless we allow Jesus to touch our lives, to touch them again and again, to fix us bit by bit until in heaven we are not only reconciled to to God in Christ, but, but completely restored before God by Christ. We profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our coming King. And I also hope and pray that we can also profess by faith that Jesus is all we need to fix us completely. I hope you can say along with me, I believe in Jesus Christ. I will follow Jesus Christ And every day I will welcome Jesus' healing touch that will bring me closer to him and closer to glory. Amen.